It's good morning. It's check, good to check, see you this check, morning. Check. Would you please stand and welcome the... Good to see you this morning. Get all excited. Go tell everybody. Get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. Get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. We'll get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. Jesus Christ is still the King of Kings. Now, if you would, just turn around and say good morning to your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to see you. It's good to see Wave at Aiden up here. He's up here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ will get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Jesus Christ is still the King of Kings. Let's say it one more time. Come on, let's say it. We'll get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. Oh, get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. Jesus Christ is still the King of Kings. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we have the announcements. Good morning. Welcome to each of you. Good to have everyone here today, especially Aiden. It's good to have him back, isn't it? Yes. Sounding good. Glad to have him here. Tonight, 6 o'clock. Baptism, Lord's Supper, we're going to discuss that, the symbolism of baptism. We, every, every Sunday night we learn something new that we hadn't heard before. So if, you wanna, if you're missing out, be there. Six o'clock, Sunday night, be here. Okay, uh, there's a, an article about Oklahoma Baptist missionaries in the bulletin. Be sure and read that. That's interesting. Fifth Sunday movie night, next Sunday, 530. And we have a treat coming up, and I'll tell you about that when I finish. 5.30, be here for movie night, and also bring goodies, sandwiches, snacks, desserts, whatever you want, and you can invite friends, just be sure and remember to bring goodies for them as well. Valentine Banquet will be February 11th at 6.30, $10 per person. If you're going to be here, be sure and sign up so we know how many to prepare for. And if you have friends that are coming, be sure and sign them up so we'll know how many to prepare for. Okay, I think we're going to have a trailer of the movie that's going to be next Sunday night. Let's give you a little hint. In 1940, Nazi forces invaded Richard and Sabina Wormbrand's home country, Romania. There were no safe spaces for Jews. And though Christian, Richard and Sabina were ethnic Jews. Be afraid, for I am with you. Genesis 26. Do not be afraid of them. Joshua 8. I am. I'm kind of afraid. They are asking to see IDs. All our lives remain now we're Jews only. Christian, really? Show me what the Christian party is going to do. What? 
Dă-te la o parte, știu că ascunzi evreii aici. Puteți să vă uitați, dar nu e niciun evreu aici. Perhaps you should get out if you still can. Run away? If we stay, I'll follow the others into prison. It will be the end of our life together. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We believe this or we don't. Richard and Sabina, like many Christians during World War II, had a choice. Lay low and hope the worst passed them by or get involved and be the hands and feet of Christ, all at great personal risk. I think we have to stay. We have a job to do. If they are coming, then they are coming. Let's not think of them as enemies to be feared, but rather as a mission. Like Sabina and Richard Wormbrand, today's persecuted Christians, living in hostile areas and restricted nations are bold witnesses for Christ. Choosing to give up their comfort and safety in this world in order to find a life that counts for eternity. The first request from our persecuted Christian brothers and sisters is, will you pray for me? As we pray for them to endure opposition in order to advance the gospel, may we be inspired by their example to pay any price necessary in obedience to Christ. this is for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here and to worship you in a free country. And we pray, Father, that you give us each an opportunity to be a witness to those that are about us, that they too may know the joy of having Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And we pray now as we receive this offering that it be used to the furtherance of your kingdom and we ask these things now in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.
Well, good morning, church. Uh, for our time of corporate prayer uh, this morning, I would like us to, or like to direct us in prayer uh, for our fellow brothers and sisters and the churches uh, that are in our uh, neighbors to the north. Uh, in uh, the nation of Canada, uh, they have just recently passed a, a law that's going to uh, bring some increasing challenges uh, to the redeemed uh, in, the, in that land. Uh, the law essentially um, criminalizes uh, holding to an exclusive standard uh, that God gives for biblical sexuality and marriage. And so this, uh, like I said, this is going to uh, bring a lot more pressure uh, upon the believers uh, in, in that part of the world and probably a foretaste of what we have, uh, what we have coming here, but uh, I just thought maybe it would be good, uh, good for us today to to pray for our fellow believers and the churches in Canada, uh, as they're going to be facing increasing pressure to conform to the patterns of this world. That we can pray for them that they would remain faithful, uh, strong. That the Lord would give them the courage uh, and the compassion that they need to stand uh, for God's truth uh, in a land of lies. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's pray together uh, as a church. Father, I pray for those who have uh, pressing government. I pray for those who have decided to pass this kind of wall. Father, I pray that you will deal with them that you will do with it in their heart, in their mind, in their morality. The Lord, things that are happening in our world, your word says it's going to come, but it's terrifying. And Father, I thank you that as our lesson in Joseph, about Joseph this morning, that you work through very hard, terrifying times to bring, to pass what you wanted to happen. Father, I pray for your people to be protected. I pray for their attitudes toward those who are bringing this pressure on them. Father, help us. Help us to know how to respond to know how to keep the same thing for I ask for it. Dear God, in the name of Jesus, we come and we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his love, his example, that he is love, what love is. Help us, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, as, as so many changes are going on around us, dear God, and as we try to stand on your word, recognizing that you are our shepherd, and that you lead us. But help us, O oh Lord, to let the light shine from us, that the world will see what love, the difference is of, of what love and the earth is, and the love of Christ is. Help us, dear God, to look up for those who have difference of opinions than ourselves, that we may be able to love them, but also to share with them what the what thus say of the Lord, and then shake the dust off our feet and move on. God, in the name of Jesus, bless our pastor as he preached these gospels. <laughs> Help his family, dear Lord, strengthen him, O Lord. Father, thank you again for your mercy and your love. And those who are standing in areas that we know not of, in mountains underneath the floors, in buildings that are dilapidated, just to spread the gospel. Dear God, in the name of Jesus, help them to stand in Jesus' name. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that America will not follow suit, that you would be in the hearts of the U.S. Supreme Court certain decisions concerning this issue and uh, laws with the states uh, that Christians will have the freedom to stand on the word. 
Our Father, Lord, I pray that you would hear and to answer these prayers uh, that have been uh, uttered uh, publicly and uh, silently. And Lord, I um, would ask that you would uh, strengthen our uh, brothers and sisters in, uh, in Canada uh, as they um, uh, brace, uh, brace for impact. And uh, Lord, that they would, uh, they would have the courage uh, necessary to uh, stand for uh, the gospel. And that, Lord, you would give them a compassion for those that are around them. Uh, that, Lord, that they might, uh, has already been asked, that they might uh, show the love of our Savior uh, to, uh, to the world uh, that, that needs it. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would also uh, prick our own hearts, that we would, um, uh, that we would uh, feel uh, for our, our fellow believers in different parts of the world that uh, you have put in, uh, in other uh, trying uh, circumstances and that we would uh, be faithful, to, as they have asked, to lift them up in prayer. Uh, and so, Lord, I pray that you would be their comforter today and our instructor. Amen. Amen. Call to worship Psalms 108 and 1. We're going to ask that you would please stand with us as, and let us read this scripture together. Let us read. My heart is steadfast, O God. God. I will sing, I will sing praises even with my soul. Amen. Even with my soul. said amen amen I don't know I was focusing on the words of that song and I was just so happy because it said he he breaks the power of canceled sin and he sets the prisoner free that 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 was us at one time amen sets the prisoner free his blood can make the foulest clean his blood availed for me I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all and all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Lord now indeed I find thy power thy power and thy love can change the lepers can change the lepers spot and melt and melt the heart of stone i 
day he washed it white as snow. Verse 3, and when before the throne I stand, I stand in him. Jesus died my soul, Jesus died my soul to my lips shall still, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white. Sin had left, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Say it again. He washed it white as snow. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. How he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave, he gave one more, one more. Oh, how he loves you, Lord. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. seated. Amen. Amen. Let there be peace on earth, and it has to start with us as individuals. Amen. When someone gets us angry, we pray, Lord, strengthen me, that I'll show you the light. Let there be peace on earth. Let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth. The peace that was meant to be with God as our Father, brothers and sisters, all are we. Let me walk with my brother in perfect harmony, yeah, yeah. let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, with every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment live each moment in 
peace eternally let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me let there be peace on earth let it begin with me help us to pray Lord through all those situations let there be peace on earth not to just speak out anything we want to say anytime we want to say it with God as our Father Lord or with God as our Father you know brothers and sisters are we let me walk with my brother and I like this in perfect harmony that takes prayer amen let Peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every little tiny step I take, let this be my solemn vow. Oh, to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally yeah. let there be peace on earth let it begin with me let it begin Well, good morning again. Well, I hope you have your Bibles uh, with you this morning. It's good to bring your Bible to church. If you don't bring your Bible to church, it's like going fishing without a fishing pole. So, you know, it's, uh, so uh, if you have it, turn to the New Testament. We're going to read a few verses from Matthew chapter 5 uh, as our launching point this morning. This is our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and so we're going to read this before we have our... Our sermon today and if you have it and if you're willing and able please stand for the reading of God's holy and inspired word from our Lord's a sermon from his own lips in Matthew chapter 5 uh, beginning in verse number 17 uh, and our Lord says <clears throat> do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And let's take a time to pray. Our Father, Lord, we thank you for bringing us here on this, your day. Uh, to this a place that we might uh, gather together as uh, your people to uh, enjoy each other's company, fellowship with one another, to sing uh, your praises, to, to pray, uh, to give, um, and uh, to listen uh, to your words. Uh, Lord, might, uh, might your word instruct us today through the power of your spirit that we might grow up into the maturity of our most holy faith. And I pray it in the name of our most holy Savior, your Son. Amen. And you may be seated. 
Well, today uh, we begin a, a new series. Uh, it's going to be a series on the Ten Commandments. Uh, we're not going to get to all the Ten Commandments today, but we're going we're to begin it uh, today. And, and really my, my intention will be, once we get into uh, the commandment is, uh, commandments, are, uh, is to be able to hit uh, one uh, commandment per week. Uh, now, that is my plan and my intent, and now the, the plans of men often fail, so uh, we'll, 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 see, we'll see how that works out, but I do try to, uh, want to uh, try to hit one per week, and that way you'll kind of have a heads up, heads up, and you'll know what's coming down the pike so that you will be well prepared uh, for, uh, for what the message is going to be. And in, in doing this, I also want to... I give each member here a challenge and to encourage everyone uh, to memorize uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, I want to uh, challenge everyone and your, uh, individually and in your homes to try to memorize these ten words and to memorize them uh, in order. Uh, it is something that, uh, in fact, uh, the Bible encourages us to, to, to memorize these. And, and do you know that that the Ten Commandments are, are foundational for, uh, for really uh, all, all of life. It is foundational for all just law and government. It must be based upon the Ten Commandments. So the ten, ten Commandments are also the standard for how we are uh, to relate to our Maker. Uh, our interactions with our Creator are to be governed by the Ten Commandments. It, they tell us how we are to worship. Uh, he, he lays down that, uh, that law there. It also governs the interactions between each other and interpersonal relationships and, and how we act between uh, mankind. The, the, the Ten Commandments tell us uh, how we are to live with one another. And it is also, you might just say, the, the basic book on parenting. You know, how, how are you to raise kids or, grand, or grandkids? You know, how, what are you to teach them? Well, it, it's all found here within the Ten Commandments. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that these Ten Commandments are to be upon our own hearts, uh, especially our, our, the, our own hearts as, as adults. Uh, and when they are on our own hearts, we are to impress them upon our children and upon our grandchildren. We are to talk about them when we get up and when we lie down and when we walk along the way. And ju just, just as we go about life, we are to, to view life through the Ten Commandments because they instruct us on how to live. Psalm 1 tells us that we are to meditate upon them day and night because they will give us wisdom in how to live life. We are to write them down so that we will know them. And in fact, we are to memorize them. We are to hide God's word in our heart so that we will not sin against him. Do you know that there is nothing more practical for a New Testament church than for us to give attention to the Old Testament law? Nor is uh, there anything more necessary and needed for a godless and a lawless society than to be confronted with God's holy law. The scripture says that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There is an order to the Bible, and that order should be followed. We follow and we listen to the law. And then after we hear the law, we hear grace and truth through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the scripture tells us uh, very plainly that we are not saved by the law. So why did God give us the law? Well, what's the purpose for the law for us New Testament Christians? We're, we're New Covenant uh, Christians. We're not saved by the law, but... But what is its, its, its purpose? And so that's kind of what I want us to think about today, to think a, give a little bit of an introduction to the law and to think about the purpose of the law. And just to summarize it uh, before we begin, the purpose of the law, uh, it exposes our sin. The law shows us that we are sinners. It, it, it also shows us the Savior. It shows us that we need a Savior and the, and the Savior who kept the law. It is also the, the standard for Christian living. 
We, we, we look at the law and we see what God requires of us as Christians and how we are to live our life. And really, when, when we look at the law and the Ten Commandments, the law is what love looks like. If we want to know how to love God, if we want to know how to love our neighbor, we must look at God's holy law because the law defines love. Uh, and so we're just going to think a little bit today in this introductory message to the Ten Commandments and think a little bit about the purpose, the purpose of the law. First of all, the law exposes our sin. Uh, God has uh, uh, given us uh, uh, the law in the first uh, part of his book, and the law defines for us right and wrong. Uh, God is our uh, creator. He is the one who uh, sets the standards, and he is the one that tells us what is right and what is wrong. In, in his holy law, we find what the definition is of good and what the definition is of bad. Uh, we, he, he lines it out for us, line upon line and precept upon precept. We, we get the standard for what is good and what is bad. We read in uh, Romans chapter 7, and I'm going to flip to quite a few verses uh, today, but Romans chapter 7 and verse number 12 uh, it may come on your screen faster than I can find them in, in sword drill here. But Romans 7 and verse number 12, we read then, So then the, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Uh, when God gave us his law and his ten commandments, it is holy, it is righteous, it is good, it is the standard for righteousness, it is the plumb line, it is the level to which everything must be measured by. You might say it is the rule for what is right. If we want to know what is right, we must look at God's righteous law. Also, the breaking of God's law or is the definition of sin. Uh, we read in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4 a very succinct definition of sin. What is sin? Well, the apostle tells us sin is lawlessness. To sin means to break God's law. It defines for us sin. It exposes our sin. And do you know that all sin falls under the ten. Any sin has to fall under the ten commandments. The ten commandments will define for us any and every sin that there is. The ten define sin. It gives us the standard for righteousness and it exposes and shows our sin. Romans chapter 3 uh, and verse number 20 gives us the purpose of the law. Uh, he says, because of the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. We're not, we're not saved by the law. We're not declared righteous by the law uh, in his sight. But it is through the law comes the knowledge of sin. God gives us his law and his standards so that we can understand what sin is and to define it properly so that sin might be seen as exceedingly sinful. Romans 7 in verse uh, number 7 uh, essentially says the same thing. For what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law bad? I mean, do we, do we do away with it? No, may it never be. On the contrary, I would not would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. I mean, you, you see, the law shows and exposes our sin when it says, I'm not to envy, I'm not to covet, I'm not to want what somebody else has. I, I see that and I'm like, man, I'm all about that. It, it shows me 
that I am a sinner. You see, the, the law defines God's will for me, his preceptive will and his perceptive will, what he has given to us on how we are to live our lives. I find it in his law because God's word is God's will. And this law that he has given, the, these Ten Commandments, this, this straight up and down righteous standard, it, it, it's transcendent. It's unchanging and it's holy. That God gives us his law and it's not our own made up law. It is something that's transcended. It's exalted. It's high, it's high of, above us. And it doesn't change. It's reliable. It's something that every generation can count on. It's not a changing standard. And it's right. It is the definition of what is right and good and true. And I think this is important for us uh, to to note here because one thing about man's standards and definitions and man's laws is his laws are always changing and his standards are always fluctuating. They're always in flux and what may be good and right at one time all of a sudden now it's not good and right and, and it's always in motion and it's always changing. You can never rely upon it because man's standards are based upon man's opinions, his own preferences, his own power and his own sinful nature. In fact, you know, Christ gave us his golden rule, but sinful man has his own golden rule as well. It goes like this, he who has the gold makes the rules. And you know, that's the way man's rules are. And, and, and it's based upon who has the power to make the rule, to enforce the rule on his own opinions and preferences. But, but you know, God's law is not that way. God's law is transcendent. It comes from above us. It's reliable and doesn't change, and it is the only standard for what is right. And, and God's law is also complete. Okay, th this is something that I, I, I think should be very meaningful to us, because there is a completeness to the commandments. I mean, you know, how, how many commandments did God give Moses on the mountain? When, when, when Jesus gave him the law, he wrote it on the you know, on, on the two stones, there were ten of them. Now, we, we all got ten fingers. Uh, that, that, that's the full complement of fingers, right? We got ten toes. Ten, it, it, it's a number of completeness and fullness. And he gave us ten commandments. And those ten words from God is the totality of all the law. It completes it. There are no more. And there are no less than what is recorded in those ten. In fact, there's an amazing verse in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse number 22. Uh, this is right after God, uh, the rehearsal of when God gave the Ten Commandments. There's two places in the Bible the Ten Commandments are listed. In uh, Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. And right after we list them in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 22 we read... These words the Lord spoke to all the assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick gloom with a great voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. Again, there is a completeness to the commandments because the ten are a foundation for a definition of any sin and the standard for all righteous and just laws. Just ten of them. If you know these ten, that, 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 that's all you need to know about God's righteous standard. And you know that this is so much more concise than man's law. You know, man's laws can often be enormous. Boy, when our lawmakers get together and they get a bill together and they want to pass a law, there are thousands of pages often encompassed in one law. Sometimes, you know, sometimes one law of our land is bigger than our whole Bible. But, but God gave us his law in ten words. 
In 10 words, you can, it, it encompasses all. In fact, we'll see in a little bit, you can even sum it up in two. But 10 words, it is complete. God's law is concise and God's law is complete, complete as it shows us what sin is and defines what good is. So that, that, that's the first point. The law exposes our sin. It shows us what right and wrong uh, is. The, the, the second the major point here on why gave, uh, God gave us the law is that the law uh, not only exposes our sin, but it shows us the Savior. Uh, the law demonstrates to us our dire need for a Savior. It shows us our need. The law cannot save me. I cannot be saved by my works or by keeping the law. That is impossible for anyone who is born a sinner. The law cannot save me, but it does show me that I need a Savior. God has given us his ten words and his ten laws, and it kind of works like a mirror. There are ten mirrors that I can look at in God's law. And the law is a mirror. And when I look in these ten mirrors, I see how dirty I am. I stand in front of the first one and like, boy, I'm an idolater. And boy, you know, I kind of like images. And I, I, haven't missed, I haven't used his name right. And, and, and it exposes me. It shows me my dire need. It shows me how dirty I am. The law is a light. His law is a, a, a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And it's a light that shines in all the crevices and darkness of my life. It, it is a mirror that shows this to me. And do you know that, that the law is essential for evangelism? for spreading the gospel and talking about the Savior. That's why the law comes first and the Old Testament comes first before the New Testament because without the law, a sinner cannot come to faith. They will never come to believe in Jesus until they come to believe and know that they are a sinner that needs a Savior because the law brings conviction of sin. The law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul because one thing it does, it shows the soul that it is a sinner before a holy God. And until you face the law, you can never know your need of the Savior. When I stand before those ten mirrors of the, the ten commandments, I, I say, man, I, I can't keep it. I don't keep it. And I won't keep it. I mean, that, that's my life when I look at the law. And so he, he gives us the law to show us this, but shows me my need for the Savior because even though we can't, the Savior can. And over the, even though we don't, the Savior did. And even though we won't, He will. That's the purpose of the law. It shows me I can't, but Christ can that I don't but Christ did you see the law when I look into the mirror of the law it points me away from myself and on to the only law keeper that there has ever been and that is the law giver himself it points me to the only son of God who is uh, uh, the one, only one that God is well pleased with. Do You know, we read in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 and 5 that, that at just the right time, God sent his son. And he sent his son born of woman and born under the law so that he might redeem those that were under the law so that they might have the rights and adoption as children. You see, he sent his son to be underneath the law so that he could keep the law for them. The law shows, I mean, all of humanity, through all history, there has never been one person that can keep the law. Not a one. There is no one righteous, no, not one. There is no one good, not, no, not one. No one has ever kept the law. We're all lawbreakers, we're all sinners. But one came 
who kept it. And the law shows me my need for that keeper of the law. The law points me away from myself to Christ because Christ came to keep the law. He, he says, in the volume of the book, it was written of me and a body you prepared for me. I have come to do your will, O God. And he did it perfectly. And with him, the Father is well pleased. The passage I read right before this message from Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 17. And Jesus says, listen guys, don't, don't misunderstand me. I did not come to do away with the law. I didn't come to abolish it. I didn't, I didn't come to, to cast it away. He says, I came to accomplish it. I came to fulfill it. That everything the law says and everything the law demands is exactly what Jesus Christ did. Because the law is the type and, and Jesus is the anti-type. He's the fulfillment. The law is the figure and Christ is the fulfillment. Uh, the law is the shadow and Jesus is the substance. You see, everything that the law said in the sacrificial system and part of the law, Jesus fulfilled it as the sacrifice and the substitute himself. But Jesus also fulfilled all the obedience part of the law. When God demands of me to live right, I don't, but Jesus did. The Messiah came to keep the moral law. He was born to obey. And the law shows me that I don't, but it shows me that he did who fulfills the law. He didn't come to do away with it. He came to fulfill it. He came to tell the truth because I speak lies. He, you know, uh, he came to love God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength because I don't. He came to be content with what gave, God gave him because I covet what God gives other people. You see, he fulfills it in my place. And that's part of the purpose of the law. A, a great passage, Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 24. Um, that the law is our schoolmaster. Uh, it, says, uh, the law, it says, therefore, the law has become our tutor, our schoolmaster, to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. I mean, it's like, you know, when you're growing up, you go to school, the, the, there's, there's some elementary things that you need to learn. You need to learn your ABCs and your one, two, threes and to read and to write. Well, the first part, part of the book, God gives us his law. It's our schoolmaster to teach us some things, to show us that I, don't, I break the law and I need a Savior. And it points to the Savior who keeps the law. It's our tutor. It teaches me that I need Christ. Because Christ kept it all, all the obedience part of it as well as all the sacrificial part of it. Do you know all the law is still in effect? Jesus just fulfilled it all for me. Everyone, a blood sacrifice is, is still required. Perfect obedience is still required. But Jesus accomplished all of that. He fulfilled it in the place of his people. You see, that's why the law is so important. It exposes my sin, but it shows us our need of a Savior. The law is concise and complete, but it also brings conviction and conversion. It is perfect. It converts the soul because it points me to Jesus Christ. And do you know that we read the law in vain? We read the Old Testament in vain if we don't see Christ he says, these are the scriptures that testify of me. And he is in every book of the Bible because he came to fulfill it all uh, in, our, uh, in our place. And so, so the law exposes our sin. It shows us our need of the Savior who kept the law in our place. Uh, but the law is also um, our standard for Christian living. Uh, Jesus said, I, I didn't come to do away with the law. 
It, it hasn't gone anywhere. The, the, the ten words are still there. Uh, and, and it is our standard for how we are to live life. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, people will say, hey, you know, we're, we're New Testament Christians and we really shouldn't give any attention to some of this, this Old Testament stuff. It's like lower tier, uh, you know, whatever. And it really doesn't have any bearing on us as New Covenant, New Testament Christians because, as the Scripture says, we are not under law, but we're under grace. And, and of course, that is true. We are not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we have faith in Christ who kept the law for us. But when we have this faith, and we are people of faith and, and trusting in Christ, does our faith do away with the law? Because I'm not saved by the law, and I'm, I'm trusting in Christ who kept it for me. Now that I'm a person of faith and grace, do I erase the law? Does faith erase God's law? Well, look at Romans chapter 3, and uh, the apostle answers this question. Uh, Romans chapter 3, um, well, uh, context, verse 28 says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. We're, we're not justified by the works of the law, but notice the last verse, verse 31 of that chapter. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Do we erase the law because of faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. We fulfill the law. We're saved by faith, and now we begin to fulfill God's holy and righteous law. Another similar one in Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 4 for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, I'm sinful flesh, I can't keep the law, there's, there's no way, I've, I've never done it. But God did it, he did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. And he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Again, faith does not erase the law. It establishes the law. He, Christ fulfilled it for us so that now it can be started to be fulfilled in us. Do you know part of, of the new covenant, the new testament, uh, when, when, when God promised the new covenant in uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, I think it's 31, but it's also uh, recorded in, in Hebrews chapter 8 that in the new covenant, when God says, I will make a new covenant with, with, with the house of Israel, part of the new covenant, he says, I will write my law upon their hearts. You see, in, in the old covenant, where was the law written? It was external on tablets of stone. It was not on the inside of man. It was on the outside of man. It was an external uh, something that, that, that was impossible for a sinful man to keep. But in the new covenant, God takes his law and he begins to write it upon our very hearts, upon our souls. He engraves it upon our hearts. That's part of the, the new covenant. And in the new covenant and in the new birth, we are now enabled by the Spirit of God to keep the law out of love for God, out of an internal motivation that God changes within us so that we now want to please Him. Do you know that before I, I couldn't please God? I wouldn't please God. It was not in my desire to please God. But now in the new covenant and in the new birth, now my wanter wants to please God. He gives us his spirit in the new covenant and within me he changes me and writes his will within my heart. And so the law is not erased by faith. It is, in fact, established by faith. Because by faith, I believe that Christ kept it for me. And now through His Spirit, He's going to work within me to please God by living according to His standards. You see, the law tells me 
what God's will is. Uh, and the Christian wants to please God's, God's will. We, we want to please God. We want to do His will. You, you know, the, the, for the Christian, for the New Testament Christian, the, there's a, a little different name for the law. James calls it the law of liberty. It, it's the perfect law of freedom. Because, you know, before conversion, Christ says in a John 8 that, that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. We're, we're in bondage to sin. We're, our will is in bondage. We're, we're in slavery. We're in slavery to sin. But now, in the new covenant, in the new birth, I am free. When the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And now we are free to obey do you, do you know that it was impossible for us to obey and keep before conversion? I mean, a sinful person cannot do it. It is impossible because by their nature they're sinners. But now in the new birth, we are free to obey. And so the law isn't erased by faith. It is established by, by faith. And as John tells us, his law is not burdensome to the believer. It's not burdensome to us when I hear what God wants of me. That he wants me to be a person of truth and a person that doesn't steal or doesn't covet. That's not burdensome to the believer. This is God's will for my life. It's not burdensome to the believer to know that I must respect authority or I'm to honor his day or his name. This, this is my standard for Christian living. And, and do you know that the, the passage I read at the beginning in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you know, he, you know, he said he didn't come to do away with it, but to fulfill it. And he says, I, I tell you that, that anyone who abandons this law and teaches others to do the same, he's going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But, but anyone who keeps it and teaches it will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We, we don't or we shouldn't do away with the law. We are to teach it and we are to keep it because we are under the law of Christ. His law shows us how to live. How to live a life that is pleasing to Him. Yes, it, it shows me my sin and that I need a Savior and by faith I'm believing in a Savior who kept it for me and He gives me His Spirit and writes His law upon my heart and now He shows me how to live and it's really how to live in love because the law is the outworking of love. Do, do you know why our world hates God's law? Because they hate. God is a God of love. He has defined for us what love is. Sinful men are full of hate. And they hate love. And the law is the outworking of love. You know that the law is all about Love. It defines for us what love is. You know, sometimes we get our definitions a little mixed up uh, in our world, but the law tells us what love is. And you know that love is not really just a warm, fuzzy feeling? It, lo love is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is an action. Love does things. That's what love is because love does and the law shows us how to live in love with our God and how to live with love with our neighbor it defines for us how to love God and how to love each other the law is about love uh, 1 John 5 and verse number 3 uh, very succinctly John defines for us what love looks like. This is love for God. What, what is love for God? Oh, it's the warm fuzzy. It's the... Yeah. This is love for God that we keep His commandments. Well, that, that's kind of an interesting definition of love. This is love for God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments aren't burdensome. I mean, that, that's what... The love of God 
looks like. That's the action of love. Jesus says the same thing in John chapter 14 and verse number, number 15. Now, let's just love Jesus, right? Well, I mean, is that a, you know, is that just a, a big kumbaya hug? And No. Uh, John 14 and verse number 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. But love does. Love, love is an action. Love for God, love for Christ keeps his commandments. And in fact, he modeled this for us. Do you know he showed that he loved his father by doing exactly what his father asked him to do? John 15 and verse number 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. The law shows us how to love, and love is defined by the law. You know, I said earlier that the, the commandments are complete. I mean, they're, they're, they're concise and complete. There's ten of them, but really, the ten of them can be summed up with two of them. You remember that, that our, our Lord was asked about this in uh, Matthew chapter you know, 22. You know, what are the greatest commandments? The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You, you, you might think of the law as um, two closet rods. One closet is the love of God and on that hang some commandments and another closet rod is the love of neighbor and on it hang the other commandments all, all the ten can be summed up with two love of God and love of neighbor the ten commandments show us what love looks like it tells me how to love God and it shows me how to love my neighbor so so how, how do I love God? Well, I, I go to that first closet. And, and on it, under love of God, there are four things hanging that tells me how to love God. I'm to have no other gods before him. He demands my exclusive devotion. I am not to make any image or representation of him because no one can be compared with our God. I am not to misuse his name. And I am to keep his day holy. That is how I love God. I, I respect his person, his image, his name, and his day. That's how we love God. It's all hanging in that first closet. There's a mirror in that closet and I look at it too and it exposes me. But on that lo love of God, there's these four ways that's how I love God. Well, how do I love my neighbor? Well, it's on the, the second table. You remember he gave Moses two, two tables. The first four and the uh, uh, first, uh, first table and the second table shows me how to love my neighbor. How do I love my neighbor? I am to honor my neighbor who is in authority over me, whether it's a parent or boss or whoever it is. I am to honor that position. I am not to harm my neighbor or murder, uh, or, or, or murder uh, my neighbor. I am to respect their life. I am to respect the institution of marriage. I am to respect my neighbor's property. I am to honor and be a person of truth, and I am to be content with what I have and not want what God gave my neighbor. You see, this is how I love my neighbor. I respect my neighbor and his life. I don't commit adultery with my neighbor or against my neighbor. I don't lie to my neighbor or steal from my neighbor, and I don't covet for my neighbor. That's how I love. That's the definition of loving your neighbor as yourself. Because you see, love is the fulfillment of God's holy law. I mean, that's what love looks like. Now, 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 
the problem in our society, as with all societies, is, is mankind wants to redefine sin and redefine love. Redefine right and wrong and redefine love and hate. But see, a, a biblical worldview, a biblical perspective, this tells me what right and wrong looks like. It shows me what love is. And if I am to love, then I am to do it through his law. Um, Romans chapter 13 and verse number 10 uh, says, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. That is how we love each other. Another similar in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 14 um, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The ten words show us how to love. It's all about love. Loving God and loving neighbor. And you know the obverse of that is also true. How do you hate? What's the definition of hating God? And hating your neighbor. Well, it's, it's breaking these ten. That's what hate looks like. And, and do you know that a lawless society is a loveless society? When, when there's no respect for authority. When life is not honored. When marriage is not honored. When truth is not upheld, when property is taken, when envy erupts, that is what hate looks like. When other gods are worshipped, when there are images of the one true God, when his name is not hallowed, and when his day is desecrated, that is what hatred of God looks like and hatred of neighbor looks like. You see, the, these ten, they define sin. They, they, they show us what sin looks like. They show us how to hate. And when I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh, well, I hate a lot more than I think I do. But, but it also points me to the Savior who came and kept it all for me. And he, he was the, the God of love. And he loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he loved his neighbor as himself. He is the standard of love. Because he kept God's law. And through his amazing salvation, he sends us his spirit and his spirit writes that law upon us and so begins to grow in us love for God and love for neighbor. So Lord willing, over the next 10 weeks, we're going to look at law and we're going to look how to love. Well, let's... Let's just stand for a concluding word of benediction and prayer. I do want to invite you back tonight. We're going to talk about a baptism and the symbolism in a baptism. Hopefully it'll be a, uh, an encouraging and a profitable uh, look at that, uh, a great, uh, that great ordinance. And so that'll be at, at 6 o'clock tonight. But let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, Lord, we do thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for speaking to us from the holy mountain and engraving it upon stone. Father, we thank you for the gift of conviction of our sin, for, for showing us our need. We also thank you for supplying all that we need in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we, we are so in need of the power and the presence of your Spirit that we might 
not walk in the flesh, but through his power as he engrafts in us a holy will to walk in your holy way. And Father, as we depart from this place on this day, might you work in us to love you more and our sin less. And Father, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And I ask this in the name of our Savior who is love. Amen and amen. And you are dismissed.